Can I get a large coffee? Is your coffee destroying bird habitat? Maybe it's time you switch to ABA Songbird Coffee, grown on certified bird-friendly farms. To learn more, visit aba.org. Hello and welcome to another episode of the American Birding Podcast from the American Birding Association. I'm your host, Nate Swick, and I am I'm just going to come out and address the elephant in the room. I know that there are a lot of folks out there feeling overwhelmed, feeling really frustrated with recent news. I I hear you. It's like it's just one thing after another, and and sometimes you just want to throw your hands up in the air, give up. I get it. I get it. But just remember, everybody, you can do it. If we learn to identify two different species of dowager, we can learn to identify two different species of willet, too. I know this to be true. I'm referring, of course, to the recent release of the first batch of taxonomic proposals considered by the North and Middle America Classification Committee of the American Ornithological Society. This is the group of bird scientists that essentially decides where in your field guide you can find a given bird. They also do splits and lumps, which is a big deal if you keep a list. If you might, you might get a new species if they split the right one. If you've followed along with this stuff in the past, you might not recognize the AOS or the NAMACC because it used to be the American Ornithologist Union until they were lumped in a bit of unintentional irony last year with the Cooper Ornithological Society to form one giant bird science organization to rule them all. And that was a, a pretty good idea. I'm not sure that the American Ornithologist Union did a whole lot to increase wages for American ornithologists. And the general strike they called in response to the proposed white-breasted nuthatch split was a bit of a disaster, particularly once they called in the strike busters. I mean, strike busters. Ugh. I mean, strike busters. I'm not going to say this whole thing was a setup for a series of bird-related union puns, but, yeah, you know, you could be the judge. Anyway, there's a lot of good stuff in this first batch of proposals. There's the Willet split I mentioned earlier. There's a proposal for a return of Myrtle and Audubon's warbler, which have been considered together as yellow-rumped warbler since 1973. There's a split of South Hills crossbill, which is the genetically distinct subspecies endemic to southern Idaho, subspecies of red crossbill. And there's a proposed name change for ringneck duck to the perhaps more descriptive ringbill duck. I think that last one is is unlikely to pass, but certainly brings up a lot of interesting discussions about common names. Uh, I wrote a post about this first batch on the ABA blog. I'll include a link to it in the show notes. There are typically two to three batches of proposals every year before the results are published in the summer. We'll keep an eye on that stuff. It's always fun to see what's going on in the world of bird taxonomy. And hey, we might get you prepared for an armchair take down the road. Uh, one quick note before we get going on this episode the aba is holding a membership drive we talked about this in the last one uh this goes to the end of february so you can join or renew your membership before february 28th 2017 and you will be entered in a drawing to win a pair of Leica trinavid binoculars a great piece of glass and one we are really excited to give away on the show today, I asked for your 2017 Bird of the Year Ruddy Turnstone stories, and you delivered. I'll share some of those in the last part of the show. But first, we'll talk with Drew Weber from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology about their Merlin app, which claims to be able to identify your bird photos, and why that's a big deal for every birder, not just novices. But first, here are your rare birds. <laughs> This is your rare bird focus for the last week in January, first week of February 2017. This last period was highlighted by a pair of birds with unknown and likely unknowable provenance. In Florida, a great white pelican was spotted among the wintering flock of American white pelicans at Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge last week. This is likely the same individual who spent a couple days at Ding around this time last year. The Florida Ornithological Records Committee tabled their discussion on this bird pending new information. Its return to the same spot the next year would certainly qualify as new info, but it's not clear what that new info means. Great White Pelican is a widespread and highly migratory Old World species, and when it first turned up last year, there was a lot of discussion about the likelihood of this bird arriving to Florida naturally, 
Perhaps by way of the relatively short jump between West Africa and Eastern Brazil, Cattle Egret famously made that jump from Old World to the New many decades ago, and Little Egret has done so in more recent times. The presence of exotic animal parks of varying quality in Florida certainly adds to the mystery. But what seems to be clear is that this bird is moving with these American white pelicans, uh, which is notable of something, probably. Though I don't know if I could say what. Another bizarre and exciting find was the discovery of a black-backed oriole visiting a feeder in eastern Pennsylvania this past week. This is a central Mexican endemic and a short distance, mostly altitudinal migrant, so a total surprise to say the least. Like the pelican, the questions such a bird raises are not easily answerable. In the pro corner, we do sometimes have a tendency to underestimate the ability of birds, even ones we consider to be relatively sedentary, to disperse to strange places. And orioles do move around. Scots oriole, hooded oriole, and bullock's oriole have well-established patterns of vagrancy in the east. It's notable that this one turned up in Pennsylvania, a state that has a recent record of Bahama woodstar, another seemingly sedentary species that showed up in a place no one expected. On the other hand, we also know that there is a big illegal market for neotropical songbirds just over the border in Mexico, though the extent of that market northwards into the U.S. is not well established. Notably, a California record of black-backed oriole from San Diego in 2000 was accepted by the California Bird Records Committee and then removed from that list a couple years later uh, because of suspicions that it was an escaped cage bird when it was seen in the same area in the winter where it had been seen. Tijuana has a very large illegal bird market just over the border from San Diego. Uh, Previously, it had been thought to be migrating with resident Bullock's Orioles. So who knows, really? The only thing that I'm certain of is that I do not envy either records committee uh, for having to deal with either of these birds. This was only a small fraction of the rare bird news in the ABA area for this period. For the whole enchilada, head to the ABA blog at blog.aba.org every Friday morning for a full roundup. Uh, And for up-to-the-minute news on rare birds throughout the U.S. and Canada, check out our Rare Bird Alert Facebook group. That's at facebook.com slash groups slash ABA rare. My guest today is Drew Weber. He's the project manager for Merlin Cornell's new bird identification app. Uh, It's a really cool program, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how it works and what birders can expect from it. Thanks for joining me, Drew. Ah, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So Merlin, as a uh, as a program, has been around for a little while, but it's it's kind of pushed up this new update recently. Uh, what has been what is what inspired Cornell to create something like Merlin in the first place? Um, Merlin was originally created back in I think it was twenty thirteen, um, and it was just um, kind of. Macaulay Library uh, folks and the eBird folks looking at, you know, what what data they had available and what they could really produce as as something that would, you know, help the general um, nature lover type uh, person to really be able to advance their enjoyment of of the birds around them, and so it really combined all these different pieces that the the lab is really uh, strong at um, into kind of like a nice little mobile mobile app um, that has been downloaded uh, about 1.25 million times now. Wow. So um, the process is pretty simple. You have a, f- a photo of a bird. Um, you can go to your mobile phone and search by that photo, or you can put the enter the photo in, and it, it basically scans it or something, and it uses it to determine an identification, which is pretty remarkable. Um, how does the program recognize what it's seeing in the photo, and how does it apply that to the uh, obviously, the the catalog of photos that Cornell mm-hmm. has that it uses to 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 work this thing. Yeah. So the the really cool thing is, um, you know, all of the stuff that is in Merlin is really um, benefiting from the massive amounts of images that have been uploaded to eBird, mm-hmm. the sightings in eBird. And so we've been working for the past about five years now with some folks from Cornell Tech and Caltech who are really into this mm-hmm. vision um, learning stuff. And they've um, been able to create these really small models for us that basically blur the image beyond recognition and uh, are able to kind of match the general patterns mm-hmm. against what our you know, training model has picked up from the, the thousands of images for each species that we have in our in our catalog at Macaulay Library. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's really pulling in these kind of like general features um, 
of of the bird that you know it's 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 interesting because it's really picking up on different things than we as birders pick up and so mm -hmm. sometimes it feels like wow this is an easy id why is it not getting it every time whereas the, there's other ones that um you know it's just it nails every single time and we're like i right. can't do that hmm. how are, how how is the app doing it yeah um so it's a kind of a, a neat comparison there so it's drawing from this catalog of uh, images in the macaulay library and I, I suppose that Cornell deserves some credit for man effectively manipulating birders into uh, uploading their photos. It certainly <laughs> manipulated me, you know, when they did the eBird profiles. And uh, in addition to the total number of species you've seen, mm -hmm. it gives you that number of, uh, of photographs you've taken or how many species that you've photographed. And it's, it's certainly encouraged me to go out and try and, you know, get photos of, uh, <laughs> Of, of birds, even common birds that I would never have thought to take photos of and upload even my terrible photos. And I have a, I have a lot of terrible photos. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's where it is drawing. <laughs> that's where it's drawing yeah. from, I suppose. Yeah. And these these terrible photos, as you say, are actually um, a great um, complement to the really nice photos that are submitted. Um, the, the photo ID feature really benefits from having the complete range of uh, qualities and postures and angles. Right. Um, really, you know, each one, no matter how terrible you think it is, um, it's really adding to the final product. Right. Even with sticks in front of them and, and half hidden and things like that. Exactly. Yeah. Because there's still, obviously, you can identify birds when they're uh, <laughs> creeping down or in the in the brush or behind mm -hmm. stuff, um, and so the the computer is able to do something similar. But yeah, that you you, you talk about the uh, kind of Cornell incentivizing you know <laughs> uploading some of these stuff these images, and it's it's very true. That was that was definitely a goal of it. Um, because if you look at if you look at the photos that we do have, mm -hmm. um, kind of before the profiles went live, it was very biased towards rarities. Yeah, I'm sure. And then then like the very common, easy to photograph stuff, but kind of like the the common, slightly harder or slightly less interesting stuff mm -hmm. in the middle just kind of was never photographed. Right. So we have like hundreds to thousands of photos of tufted flycatcher, um, or pine flycatcher in mm -hmm. Arizona. But we don't have very many photos of um, like Ross's geese or, yeah. you know, much, much more common things that anybody could actually go out and take a photo of. Yeah, well, it's telling me that I need to go get a photo of a uh, red-bellied woodpecker, which is something that I've been <laughs> meaning to do uh, for a nice. while. Yeah, it's, it's one of the ones that apparently I need. So thanks, Ebert, for <laughs> getting me getting me moving on that. Um, cool. So I, I downloaded Merlin uh, to my phone. I've been playing with it for a few days and I've thrown a few um through photos at it, um, some difficult ones, some ones that I've taken, you know, through my through my scope with my phone, because mm -hmm. they're the ones that are on my phone, uh, without any sort of adapter or anything. So the, some of them are kind of blurry and distant, and it's actually done a really great job. I um, I had like a fall morning warbler um, that nice. I took uh, that hit a window, and I had a had a oh, you know, nice. picture of it. <laughs> and, and this yeah. was a photo that I took in Colombia, not one that I've taken in the U.S. But it still, you know, that is not an easy bird. It's kind of a mm -hmm. you know not. The patterns are similar to other species and it it, mm -hmm. it picked it up it, well morning warbler was the third choice uh after chat and connecticut warbler which you know narrowed it down pretty well mm -hmm. uh and then i i have some really kind of t bad photos of um a uh, Baird sandpiper that I took uh, here in my home <laughs> county and it nailed it it nailed that one nice. so that certainly um <laughs> plays into this idea where you think where you where you said that the algorithm was able to pick up birds that are very difficult because i think of Baird sandpipers being a you know not an easy id um, mm -hmm. And this was a young bird with a nice scalloping, so maybe it picked up on nice. that as well. So, yeah, and I gave it a, a short bill dowager as well, and it, it hit that one as well too, um, which, That's is, awesome. which, is, which is great. <laughs> it didn't even give long bill dowager as an option, uh, which I thought was really neat. Uh, mm -hmm. It goes to show that you know you can put these these birds on here that are not necessarily you know gimme IDs, and it's able to mm -hmm. able to to pick that up, which is great. Yep. Yeah. So, what are the plans for for Merlin down the road? You already it's already pretty good at identifying birds in you know, continental U S and Canada, are you, are you planning on taking it into other parts of the world and what are sort of the limiting factors uh, for doing that? What do you need to do that? Yeah. So we, we are definitely planning on expanding this. Um, we've been for the last, the last month or so have been working on a Yucatan pack. So we'll mm. be adding the three states that make up the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Um, and we've been training up the photo ID model for that. And, uh, 
all, by all accounts, it seems to be working pretty good. We were actually just testing the photo ID model um, in Costa Rica. Some of the lab members were in Costa Rica for about a week. You know, it, was, it seemed to be doing a great job of getting female trogons from the back oh, wow. and uh, hummingbirds and, uh, you know, like all this stuff. It's it's uh, mountain Elenia, um <laughs> good stuff that uh, will, you know, be very beneficial to even just a birder that mm -hmm. hasn't been in that area before. Oh, absolutely. Um, so it's exciting to exciting to see that, um, you know, translating into actually working down there. But yeah, our goal is to kind of keep heading south, probably not like in a continuous like pack after pack going south. We'll probably do like some Brazil, maybe some Argentina, uh, Costa Rica, then mm -hmm. pop, pop back up to some of Central America. But most of it is entirely dependent as far as the photo ID stuff on um, the submissions to eBird. So we're really targeting at least 500 photos of each species, mm -hmm. which is right now asking a lot for quite a few of the, uh, the tropical right. um, species. Um, but we, we definitely see that we're able to get more, more and more people submitting photos with their submissions, mm -hmm. and it's uh, really helping to improve what we're, we're able to do. Um, the other thing that we're using the photos for is uh, we're now pulling all the pulling photos directly from eBird submissions to populate the new uh, Merlin photo galleries. Mm -hmm. So if you take a you know crushing image of a Quetzal, your photo could be featured um, in a in a future release. Oh, cool! Which we think is a a really fun way to kind of pay back some of these great photographers for mm -hmm. uh, contributing to the to the Macaulay Library. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so eBird also allows you to submit uh, vocalizations of birds. Do you think that there is any way, I mean, and I assume that this would probably be a different a different algorithm, a different program, to create a sort of uh, Merlin-type program for bird vocalizations? That's always been sort of considered the holy grail of, <laughs> of computer birding uh, intersection. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's something that we're definitely um, thinking about and talking about a lot, um, how we can you know, kind of adapt some of these photo models to something that could identify basically the spectrogram. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of the, a lot oh, of the technology yeah. would translate pretty easily. Yeah, um, that's, that's interesting. I, that's not the direction that I would have necessarily uh, gone with it. But yeah, eBird provides a, a visual representation of a bird vocalization. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, have a, a standard for that, then that would probably be easier than, than some program that has to listen to, that listens right. to Right. Yeah, and so there's there's a bunch of different ways that um, people are working on these sorts of problems, and uh, we have we have really good partners at Caltech and Cornell Tech who are kind of on the forefront of a lot of the the research in these sorts of things, and so you know as as new developments come in, they can kind of uh, you know pull in what makes sense for for these sorts of problems, mm -hmm. um, and I'm really. I'm really excited about the opportunity to actually tackle that someday. Yeah. <laughs> even, even the photo part seems like has always seemed like it was, you know, five years in the future. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's cool that it's, it's here now. Yeah. It certainly seems like magic sometimes um, <laughs> to have that available. So Merlin obviously has applications for, for novice birders and trying to figure out identification. So it might be tough, but um, does it has some applications that might be useful for uh, more experienced birders as well. Doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, when you think about uh, what a novice birder actually is, is someone who's, you know, not familiar with the birds that are around them. And, you know, even as uh, well experienced birders, that's kind of what that's the situation we find ourselves in when we're traveling to a new area. So Merlin can be a very uh, useful additional tool for, uh, you know, even advanced birders who are traveling to a, a new region of the world for them. The other place that we're expecting to use Merlin sometime in the future, um, rather than, you know, or as an addition to the app, which is a, a great tool for, for birders to use out in the field, we're hoping that we can also incorporate it into the actual eBird data quality process so that at some point we can be, you know, looking at the photos that are uploaded and giving them kind of a, a, a score whether uh, the photo ID thinks that's an accurate identification for the photo. So it's kind of a, a first pass to, you know, filter out some of the misidentifications or, you know, when users upload a photo accident accidentally to the wrong species, right, which happens a lot. Yeah. 
So the, the system could just be as a simple uh, filter, you know, kind of uh, kicking some of this stuff into the, a review queue for, uh, you know, the experts to look at and to approach uh, the people that submitted it. Or it could even, you know, down the road, uh, offer alternative IDs based on what it, what it thinks the uploaded photo actually is. Uh, so it could cool. be a very, you know, broad learning tool and data quality tool. Um, so where can, where can birders find Merlin? You can find it on the App Store uh, for iPhone or iPad. You can find it on the Google Play Store for Android. Um, there is talks about a web version, so PCs oh, right. could use it, and Windows phones and other platforms, but that's currently um, currently not available. Yeah, and it's completely free app. Always will be. That's always that's always a perk. One fun thing that uh, is relatively new in Merlin. One of the complaints has always been that it's a, such a large app. Mm -hmm. um, in the previous release, 1.1, we added the ability to just download a, a subset of the species. Mm -hmm. So you, if you're living in the Northeast U.S., you can just download, you know, the 200 megabytes that make up that pack, mm -hmm. um, and then you know use the the app to its fullest just in that area with a much smaller app. Yeah, that's uh, great. The other idea. fun thing you can do is you don't even have to download any packs to use photo ID. Uh, you won't get any photos when you identify something, but it can still identify that whole um, list of 650 species right. without any packs. Right. So, if, so when I put the morning yeah. warbler on, I had only downloaded the Southeast pack. And so it when it pulled up, you know, Connecticut warbler didn't have a mm -hmm. photo associated mm -hmm. with it, which I figured that was the case. That, yeah. Yeah, so it makes it makes it easy to identify those vagrants, which I'm really mm -hmm. excited about. I'm hoping that we can really empower some uh, some newer newer birders to um, po you know feel more confident about that strange bird in their backyard. Absolutely, um, and at the very least, even if the bird, even if Merlin cannot identify the bird precisely, which it does a lot, it gives you the the ranked options too. So you mm -hmm. can you can take that and go back to your your other you know references and. Um, mm -hmm you know, with the kind of focus your, your attention on just those species and try and figure it out too, instead of being, you know, sort of overwhelmed by an entire book of you know, 800 exactly. plus species. Yeah. It's just supposed to be like an, another tool to help you reach the correct result. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it'll take you right there. Sometimes it'll require a little bit more help. Um, but yeah, just an additional tool to help you get to the right result and feel confident that when you're, you know, deciding that this is, you know, a morning warbler, that that's mm -hmm. actually what you're seeing. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you uh, joining me, Drew. Uh, Drew Weber, once again, is the project leader for Merlin Cornell's app. You can check it out on iTunes and Google Play. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Before I head into the last segment of our show today, I have one more quick announcement. We are looking for conservation milestones for the next Birder's Guide to Conservation and Community. Birder's Guide is our quarterly publication. Uh, we know that there are a lot of ABA members and friends who are doing really great work for bird conservation in their communities, and we want to showcase that in the magazine. So if you want to promote your own conservation initiative, or if you know someone who deserves their work to be featured by the ABA, please... Uh, get in touch with Michael Redder, Birders Guide Editor, at M-R-E-T-T-E-R-M-Redder at A-B-A dot org. So a few weeks ago, back in the first episode of 2017, I asked listeners of the podcast to share some of their ready turnstone stories, and I'm really happy that a number of you took me up on that. With Birds So Charismatic, I figured that uh, some people had stuff that they wanted to say. So I'll, I'll start by reading some of those that I received. John Gluth commented at the ABA blog, Back in September 2001, just a few days into a two-week birding field trip encompassing Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and New Jersey, I paid a visit to the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel Visitor Center. Upon returning to my car, I spied among the expected goals scavenging in the parking lot a ready turnstone, which seemed to have developed a taste for french fries, calmly picking up those spilled or intentionally dropped onto the pavement. I had to smile, but I also hoped that it would return to the relative safety of the bridge's rocky abutments and a healthier diet. That's a great story. Thanks, John. Uh, Jason Leifester writes... I grew up on the Texas coast, so I saw ready turnstones frequently. I gained a new appreciation for them when I spent three summers, 1990 through 1992, doing bird surveys around the Prudhoe Bay oil field in Alaska's North Slope. The turnstones were only found along a very narrow band of wet saline tundra near the beach, but they were hard to miss because they were so noisy and aggressive. 
Thanks, Jason. Mark Rauson brings a story from the newly included Hawaii, commenting that they are vampires on Kure in the extreme northwestern Hawaiian islands. I observed them landing on Hawaiian monk seals and pecking open old wounds from shark bites and drinking the blood, thereby keeping the wound from healing completely. That is awesome and also very gruesome. Thank you, Mark. And uh, the last story comes from Kirby Adams. He writes, years after the fact, I still remember my life a ruddy turnstone for how the experience embodied what I love about birding. It was during one of the early biggest weeks in American birding festivals back in 2010. My wife and I were on the shorebird tour, car caravanning around Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge with the friendly guide pointing out birds in the fields. A U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service truck pulled up, and the woman driving it alerted our guide that there was a ruddy turnstone on the beach at Metzger March, just a couple of miles away. The guide yelled, on to Metzger, and we all hopped in our cars. The excitement was palpable, and in my memory, people were sliding over the hoods of their cars and peeling off in clouds of dust. It probably wasn't quite that dramatic in reality, but I remember thinking at the time how wonderful it was that a diverse group of people were stirred to a shared excitement by a few words passed on to us by a stranger in a truck. The words, ruddy turnstone, held some magic in birding parlance, and I was part of the crowd that understood it. When we arrived at Metzger, the bird didn't disappoint. It looked as sharp and colorful in the paintings in the field guide, and it was flipping pebbles on the beach just like the text said they do. That's another magical part of birding that you have you have to experience to understand. You see a bird for years in the field guides and read about its habits and habitats, and then you see one in person, and it's exactly what your mind pictured. It's like the commercial where Santa Claus and the anthropomorphic M&M look at each other and exclaim, He is real, and then simultaneously faint. When the bird in the field fulfills your field guide fantasies, it's enough to make you weak in the knees. The ruddy turnstone was perfect. He adds, This past spring, I was sailing to Fort Sumter in South Carolina for some history and birding. Approaching the island, I caught a flock of ruddy turnstones still in winter plumage as they lifted off from the rocky shore. It reminded me once again of that lifer in Metzger and that you can't beat birding as a hobby for a lifetime. Thanks, Kirby. What a great story. Thanks, everybody. If you have any Ready Turnstone stories that you'd like to share with us at the ABA American Birding Podcast, please let me know. You can find me at podcast at aba.org. Thanks for listening. The American Birding Podcast is brought to you by the American Birding Association. You can find this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and the Google Play Store. If you like what you're listening to, please go leave us a review or even just a rating. It helps people find us and it helps get our name out there. We really appreciate it. President of the ABA and executive producer of the American Birding Podcast is Jeffrey Gordon. Technical production is by John Lowry with help from Greg Meese and David Hartley. You can find us online. We're on Facebook and Twitter at ABA. That last one, please don't mistake us for the American Bakers Association, though I, you might be able to get free cakes for them. Questions or comments about the podcast, you can email them to me at podcast at ABA.org. I'm Nate Swick. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next time. This episode of the American Birding Podcast is brought to you by Global Rescue, the ABA's official emergency medical and evacuation provider. Global Rescue is a worldwide leader in field rescue, medical evacuation, and security extraction services for more than a decade, and their industry-leading network of personnel and resources are on call to provide assistance or evacuation from nearly anywhere on Earth. When ABA members purchase a Global Rescue membership through the association, a portion of the proceeds will go to helping ABA programs and conservation. For more information, go to www.globalrescue.com slash partners slash ABA.